today I will talk about a gender equality project from, from the Faculty of Mathematics and, and Natural Sciences at Oslo University. And I will start to give you some background on the project. It started in 2015, it's still not finished. When we started, the management said that they had a 10 year perspective. So we still have some, some years left, four or so. Uh, and the starting point for the project was that the faculty was not gender balanced as all STEM faculties. Uh, more female students than female professors and research management. Um, so the management wanted to know if this was an effect of gender inequality. They thought that it was that, but, but they wanted to be sure. And, and what could they in that case do about it? Um, the project activities, the workshop, the management training programs, the career programs and so on, were, were closely integrated with the research. We were researchers doing the workshops, doing the management training programs and so on. Um, but we were also using all the research in the project immediately in the pro project activities. When we had got some results, we were immediately going there, sharing them in the workshops and so on. Uh, and the, the research, it was a combination of methods. We were doing two questionnaires one to employees, one to students, interviews with even more than 90 employees, and also action research. We were following all the project activities, seeing what worked and what did not work so well. Um, the project was funded by the Norwegian Research Council, the program Balance, and um, it is presented in a book, or kind of halfway, the first five years we, ha we have uh, um, we, we have um, collected all the results and, and uh, presented them in a book. The book is still just in Norwegian, otherwise you can find it on open access. It's still just in Norwegian, but it will be translated. What I would like to talk about today is how to move from just knowledge to changed based on knowledge. Because that is something that I have been thinking about, trying to understand during the project. And uh, um, something that surprised me really much in the beginning of the project was that when we presented results from our research, combined with other research on, on gender inequality in academia, for, for example, a group of, of PhD supervisors, um, when we talked to them when we presented the research on on how PhD students experienced unequal structures uh, in the PhD supervision or in the work environment, I kind of thought that that would um, start, even if the PhD supervisors listening to this, I maybe I, I didn't believe that they should you know, go right out of the door and start doing something totally different that they had done before they heard this, this uh, research. Um, but I thought that it should start a discussion in the room, that it should be a discussion on how, how could we change this? If we, now when we heard that it is like this, what could we do different? And instead, um, I always got a lot of questions. Um, what is most important to do now? Give us some, some best practice. Please tell us what to do. And I, I thought that, but I have told you, I have given you all information. It's just to start doing something. For example, if I showed a slide like this, this is from the survey to the master's students. Uh, and it shows that the male master students, 10% of them experience negative academic treatment uh, and 16% of the female students. And if we go to negative social treatment, it's 9% of, of the male student and 28% of the female student that experience this. So if I, I show this, this slide, 
talked about it and, and gave some more information about how can we change, what, what can we do, how can we change the work environment for our math, master students. We could, for example, work with role models. How do we use the female professors that we have? Do we give them the prestigious uh, large lectures, the lectures, you know, in the beginning of the course with all the students or or how, how do we do we think about role models at all when when we plan the teaching sessions? How do we work with, with examples? I, I um, when we are teaching, when when we are, are um, I was using when I was talking about theories, when I had my lectures in management and leadership and was uh, want to uh, describe how theories can be used, how theories and models can be used. I showed a photo of my grandfather's toolbox. He was a carpenter and I showed a, to a photo of his toolbox. Um, and I had some points with that. I, I, I mean, I wanted to say that tools are not, um, um, they, they are not unmodern immediately. You can use, you can use them in different ways and so on. But, but it still, it was a kind of, of course, I should have used a, a more gender neutral uh, photo than, than or example than the toolbox. There are lots of those examples and interactions inside and outside the classroom. How we as teacher interact with, with the students. I did a study at um, a Swedish University of Technology 10 years ago um, and it, it was really interesting. I was interviewing teachers and students at the same bachelor program. So they were talking about each other. And when the teachers talked about the female students, they said that they need much more support and encouragement than the male students. They don't they are not as self-confident as a male student. And when I interviewed the female students at the program, the female student that the teachers were talking about, they, they said about the teachers, they are condescending. They do not treat us as competent. Um, and when the teachers described their students, they talked about these orderly, careful girls sitting in the front row and the messy guys arriving a bit late, sitting in the back with their feet on the table. And surprisingly, there were always some of those guys that, that, that were the brill turned out to be the brilliant one, the best one in the class. Um, and they explained this by the female students, they know how to study. Uh, they, they know how to, to learn something, to, to to uh, read something and, and remember that, but but they were not good at independent thinking. But the boys, those messy boys in the back of the classroom, they they weren't used to studying. They didn't know how to how to just you know learn something that was said in a book, and therefore they managed university studies better. They were better at independent thinking. So I mean, there's so much that we could do to change the work environment for, for the master students. Um, but that discussion, it was so hard to get that concrete discussion. Or another example, employees, this is from the, from the survey uh, of the employees, the employee survey. 11% um, of the male employees answer that they experienced that they were constantly under scrutiny and 22% of the women. 15% uh, of the men <clears throat> experienced that they had to work harder than colleagues to be valued as legitimate researchers and 24% of the women. And 16% of the men said that professional isolation had negatively affected their career and 22% of the women. And the last slide, or the last um, eleven percent of no, sixty percent of the men and ten percent of the women uh, said that the culture was encouraging. So if if you hear something like this, if you get these numbers, 
of course, there is a lot of things that you could do to, to change the researcher's work environment. Um, there are a lot of research on this, other research. For example, Lisa Husu from the beginning of 2000 that said that the, or found out that the largest obstacle to gender equality in academia today may be a, a lack of support in the form of non-events such as not being seen, not being heard, not being read, not being referred to, not being quoted, not being invited, instead of direct discrimination. And if it is like that, what could we do? We could, um, I could go and look at my networks, which, who, who, who do I cooperate with? Who do I invite? Uh, where am I invited? Um, how do I act in meetings? Who am I listening to, answering? How am I supporting, interacting with? Or who am I talking to in the lunchroom? Where do I choose to sit and eat my lunch sandwich? If I'm working with a conference, which keynote speaker do I invite? When I go to a research seminar, how do I read the articles of the female and the male doctoral students? How do I give them feedback? How do I treat them? How do I interact with them? There's so much things to do. Um, or another result from, from our research, we found out that associate professors, um, among associate professors, the, the women spend 24% of their working time on research while the cor corresponding figure for men was 35%. And at the professor level, the women spent 33% of their working time on research, while men spent 39%. And uh, a study from the Swedish Research Council last year, they say that working hours spent on research, that is the main re reason for not having gender balance in academia. They, in their large study, they found that women, women were both overrepresented in research areas that were characterized by a high proportion of teaching. And within all research fields, women had less time for research than their male colleagues. Um, so what could you do about that? Of course, we could look at teaching. How do we divide it? Some courses, some courses are, we have to spend much more hours working on some courses than others. Um, the academic housework, who is doing that? Who is planning the conference? Who is uh, doing the reviews? Who is supervising? Career guidance for, for new associate professors. Do we do that? That was something that they were asking for in, in our project. Uh, they didn't know what to say yes and what to say no to. Uh, or maybe we should work on changing the competence requirements and not have that much focus on, on just research, but as much as, as teaching and, and this academic housework. So, uh, why? Um, why wasn't it enough with just knowledge? We had a lot of knowledge from our own faculty. There was a lot of other research and still the change didn't really happen. Um, we, when I get the statistics and figures, that gives me a lot of, of information of how I could start working on to change things. Um, we understood in the beginning of the project that that wasn't enough. So we also had a lot of, of interviews. We did the interviews. We had, we had these explanations um, to the figures. Why? We had the stories that, that could give examples on, on why things were happening and how they were happening. And that wasn't enough either. So we went on with models. <laughs> We build theories, models um, to give um, a framework that could be used in, in this work. But, but still, um, it wasn't that 
kind of energy in moving forward. So um, what we came up with was that what is needed for, for making this knowledge to, to be a base for, for change is um, sharing experiences. It, it is challenging an ideology and, and a thought pattern. And to do that, uh, we require a collective process. We need to talk to others um, because the statistics and the explanations and the models, they had to be, they need to be filled with examples, our examples. And when it is just me sitting there with my view on on my surroundings on my working group on my students on on my career it's really easy to see things as just um just something that happened once not a pattern not part of a structure not something that could be changed it was just something that happened once to me uh, and maybe twice to me, but, but it was different circumstances. So we, we do need to talk with others and um, listen to their explanations, their experiences, their examples and share our own to be able to see the patterns. And, and uh, first, when we do that um, we can we are able to to move on to changing um, the things that we are doing in our everyday working life okay that was that was what I wanted to to say today